Welcome to everybody. Good morning uh, to our first public lecture with Manfred Steger. My name is Roland Benedictor and I'm a member of the Center for Advanced Studies, which is part of Eurac Research, uh, a social science think tank in the European Alps. Our first lecture with Manfred Steger is dedicated to the topic uh, re-globalization or deglobalization which is part of a series about the current change, transition, or reform of globalization, what in the past some scholars have called the global systemic shift. Professor Steger will explain us uh, two theoretical approaches to the current transformation of globalization in his first two lectures out of four, and the second uh, two lectures, so lecture three and four, will be more about practical approaches. Professor Steger is one of the most renowned scholars on globalization. He was instrumental in co-creating the discipline of global studies. Um, Manfred is currently professor of global and transnational sociology at the University of Hawaii Manoa and global professorial fellow at the Institute of Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. He has written uh, extensively about the current phase of globalization, but also about its past and uh, prospective futures. Uh, he is the celebrated author of numerous books on globalization, such as The Rise of the Global Imaginary, Political Ideologies from the French Revolution to the Global War on Terror, with Oxford University Press, Globalism Facing the Populist Challenge, uh, what is global studies theory and practice and most recently globalization matters engaging the global in unsettled times his bestseller globalization a very short introduction with oxford university press is one of the standard uh, works on the current uh, phase of globalization and of course manfred is our global um, distinguished scholar at Eurac research um, Center for Advanced Studies for 2021. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to Manfred Steger and enjoy the public lecture. Manfred, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, and I also want to extend my thanks to Harald Bechana and uh, the, uh, the team uh, in the uh, Center for Advanced Studies. Uh, I just want to uh, give you uh, a little bit of a sense of what will transpire in this year, uh, as Roland mentioned, where I have the honor and great pleasure uh, to be the 2021 uh, Global Distinguished uh, Fellow uh, at the Center for Advanced Studies. Uh, uh, among other things, uh, I will give four public lectures. So the first two public lectures, uh, today's public lecture, and uh, the one uh, in uh, June will be uh, more theoretically oriented. And the second uh, lectures will be more practical, uh, as uh, Roland mentioned. So uh, the important thing here that I want to start out with is uh, the title itself. The title of my lecture today is Deglobalization or Reglobalization. Rethinking Theoretical Approaches. Uh, about eight years ago, in 2013, Roland Benedictor published a remarkable article in the journal New Global Studies. And the article was entitled Global Systemic Shift, a Multidimensional Approach to Understand the Present Phase of Globalization. Now, what I find remarkable about this article is both its form and its contents. Roland chose the form of a new Neoplatonic dialogue of self-posed questions that he then answered in this article, which as you can imagine is very risky, especially for social scientists, uh, but I think was extremely successful because not only did Roland bridge uh, the humanities and the social sciences in this article, but I think uh, he also uh, brought into it the logic of dialectics, which I think is extremely important in trying to gain some analytic and normative clarity. 
The second remarkable thing, of course, was the contents. Uh, and Roland basically introduced the idea of a global systemic shift. Some people had talked about it, but that's what he centered on within a new theoretical globalization framework. So uh, Roland noted that in order to understand the current phase of globalization, we need to understand this global systemic shift, which for him denoted a changing globalization pattern that involves the interaction of six core fields. And the six core fields that he identified were politics, economics, culture, religion, technology, and demography. And then he said there's a seventh dimension, and that was the overall transformative configuration of globalization itself, which he argued was bigger, was larger than the sum of its parts. And here, of course, Roland drew on complexity theory. He brought, in other words, complexity theory into dialogue with globalization theory in terms of nonlinearity, self-organization, that systems are self-organizing. Globalization is not just nonlinear, it's self-organizing. There are emergences, new elements that are uh, unanticipated. Irreducibility, we cannot reduce any of these parts or globalization to any of these parts. We have to look at all of them in interaction. Adaptation, that various parts adapt to each other, but they also create tensions with each other. And finally, unpredictability, that a nonlinear model of uh, globalization is one that brings complexity in, but makes it much, much more difficult to predict where it's going to go. And nonetheless, Roland did uh, at the end dare to make some predictions. And the predictions that he made were in those six areas or six dimensions that he introduced. So he anticipated globalization, its current phase to move towards an end of neoliberalism in the economic sphere, the end of what was then called the new global world order in the political sphere, the end of postmodernism in the cultural sphere, the renaissance of religion, the ascent of technology, particularly digital technology, and the growing importance of demography. Six predictions within a system that really looks down on predictability, I think it's a very daring thing to do. And I think his predictions were quite on the mark. So the purpose of my presentation today is to continue to complement and to extend these efforts that Roland put into uh, writing, committed into writing uh, eight years ago, in terms of understanding the current phase of globalization. So the core questions for my talk today are sort of similar. The first question is, what are some useful approaches to assess the current phase of globalization? And perhaps how can we characterize this phase? And secondly, is the world moving towards deglobalization or reglobalization? So starting with the first one first, the theoretical approaches to assess the current phase. Roland eight years ago was characterizing the then current phase of 2013 as wild. My term eight years later is disjunctive disjointed, disconnected phase of globalization that unfolds in the social context of what I call the great unsettling. And here, I would like to give you a, uh, if possible, I would like to give you a little bit of a visual uh, understanding of what I'm talking about. So if you just allow me to, uh, bring on uh, my, uh, my images here. Just one second. There we go. 
There we go. Is this visible? Can can somebody give me a, a verbal? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, what do I mean when I say that this current wild, disjunctive, disjointed phase of globalization unfolds within a social context of the great unsettling? The great unsettling for me is really shorthand for uh, an intense phase of political and social instability, insecurity, and volatility. And what I put up here for you are just some markers of what has transpired in those terms over the last uh, two decades or so. So in the 1980s and 1990s, we had neoliberal market globalism that as we all know, succeeded a Keynesian paradigm, a relatively settled Keynesian paradigm that by the 1970s, by that I mean regulated capitalism, a social welfare system, uh, you know, cultural homogeneity, all of those things, that by the end of the 1980s uh, was really starting to actually very much unsettle the old paradigm and move into what a lot of people at the time thought was something like uh, market fundamentalism. In other words, it began to really shake up on various levels of everyday experience, what people saw as their familiar context. Another marker are the reactions to neoliberal market globalism in the 1990s and 2000s. The global trade protests, the anti-WTO pro protests in Seattle, and then moving around the world from city to city, from local context to local context which again, we see the interaction of the global and local here. Uh, and it was a clear pushback against this dominant uh, neoliberal market uh, globalization from above. Another marker of the great unsettling, post 9-11 transnational terrorism, the spread of terrorism, of a particular form of terrorism that became in, in a way uh, exported around the world and was delinked from a center. It was really a decentered form of transnational terrorism. Another very unsettling, especially on the ontological existential level, very unsettling series of experiences. Then of course, the 2008, 2009 global financial crisis, which bled over into the ensuing European sovereign debt crisis. Greece, Portugal, Ireland. We all remember. We all remember the, the, the sense of uh, social injustice that a lot of people in Southern Europe or on the periphery uh, to Germany and France felt uh, in, in, those, uh, in this context, how unsettling it was, how economically tough it was, the unemployment rate, the sense of jobs really changing or disappearing altogether. Then of course, the migration crises in the plural of the 2010s. And here I'm not just referring to uh, the migration crises with regard to uh, Central America and North America, but a variety of those, certainly in Europe, the Syrian uh, political refugee uh, movement that occurred. Uh, you know, at the beginning, a uh, very, very strong sense among people that uh, something had to be done, but then a lot of people felt overwhelmed. There were a lot of uh, activities that occurred in reaction to that. And this migration crisis also occurred in Southeast uh, Asia. So let's think of places like Myanmar, where the Rohingya were displaced and on the move. So there was this sense of people on the move, of, of, of globalization and, and, and uh, movements of bodies that were unsettling. Then the 2010s also, the global surge of national populism that a lot of people saw as a backlash to this sort of great unsettling, to restabilize things. <clears throat> 
leaders that promised people a return to the cocoon, a return to the bubble, a return to the old nation state, a return to homogeneity, a return to uh, a sense of familiarity of the local and the national that it would be undisturbed by these globalization dynamics. And finally, of course, perhaps the biggest of all, the 2010, 2020-21 uh, current COVID-19 pandemic, which I will come back to towards the end of the talk. But I really want to emphasize that the reason I'm saying perhaps uh, the biggest is because it truly was one of those things that occurs primarily, I would say, maybe you know, once every few decades. The last pandemic of that size, as we all know, uh, is about was about 100 years ago. So again, there's a certain uh, unsettling that went from uh, the political and social to the imaginative, to the psychological, all the way down to the ontological level to the very existential level of how people feel uh, in terms of space and time, their embodied existence, their uh, routines that are pre-reflexive, all of those types of things, I think were tremendously uh, unsettled. That's why I call it the great unsettling. And for me, that's the context. And it's in intricately connected to globalization processes. So here's my argument. The great unsettling has led to and interacted with globalization dynamics that are reconfiguring. In other words, globalization is increasingly disjointed, which feeds into the great unsettling. The great unsettling feeds back into globalization, which increasingly is characterized by what I call disjunctive globalization, what eight years ago, Roland called wild globalization. However, my argument is that we have to understand this disjunctive phase of globalization, not as a global, not as deglobalization to the court, but we actually have to understand it is re-globalization. So I'm already answering the second question in a way that I brought up. So my argument will be that in order to really understand what is going on with regard to these disjunctive globalization dynamics, we need to delineate theoretical and embrace theoretical approaches that are capable of sort of analyzing what is happening. And I would say that there are really three large theoretical approaches or models that are out there that can help us. So while I will favor the third one, the first two that I'm going to introduce will also be approaches that are helpful, but I think they have their limitations. So let's take a look at what I mean. The first theoretical model is perhaps the most elegant. It's relatively simple, parsimonious, and it basically argues that we can understand globalization and globalization processes. And here I uh, define globalization as the expansion and intensification of connectivities, mobilities, and imaginaries across local space and time right, both global and local space and time. And this model is basically suggesting that we can understand and analyze globalization dynamics in terms of two major dynamics. The first one objective, the other one subjective. So subjective uh, 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 connectivities and mobilities would include the movement of capital, the movement of goods, of services, of technologies, of people. The second is subjective. We also have to understand globalization in terms of consciousness. 
So that involves the mobility, the connectivity of ideas, ideologies, meanings, symbols, uh, narratives, imaginaries, and so on. And the argument here would be, and this is why I said it's the simplest, that if we really want to understand where we are at, the current phase of globalization, what we have to understand is what is the relationship, and this is what the errors seem to indicate here, what the relationship is between the objective and the subjective uh, dynamics of globalization. Now, again, the advantage is it's very parsimonious. The disadvantage is that it only gives us two dimensions to deal with. And even within those dimensions, we are then forced to drill down. And what I mean by that is that we can't just leave it at objective. We then have to find subcategories and have to talk about capital, goods, services, technology, people, and same thing on the subjective side, which means that the very purpose, the very raison d'etre for this theoretical model to be parsimonious is falling apart. So perhaps it would have been better in that case to actually move to a different model, which is what I call theoretical model two, and that is globalization as a multidimensional process. So rather than just splitting it up into objective and subjective, we're looking at globalization in terms of a series of interconnected dimensional uh, uh, forms. So what we have here are you know, a number of those dimensions that are very frequently mentioned. Uh, the ones with the asterisks are the ones uh, that Roland identified in his work or that he focused on his work, economy, politics, culture, religion, technology, and demography. But of course, we could add to that the environment, which I think is very important, ideology, art, military, and many other dimensions. Now you can already see where this is going, right? In terms of using this theoretical model to analyze the current phase of globalization, the advantage is that we are comprehensive. We can cover quite a lot. And we delineate it, we lay it out very clearly. We can also build specific projects around each one of those dimensions. The problem is, that we are in a runaway situation here. Which ones, first of all, are the ones that we should really concentrate on? In other words, what sort of criteria do we use to adjudicate, to decide which ones are the most important dimensions that really tell us the most about where globalization is currently? And then also the problem, as I said, the runaway problem in terms of having too many dimensions, of adding too much, it becomes too complex. It becomes too difficult to actually get across some of the, the, the critical points in ways that make sense analytically and yield the sort of knowledge that uh, we are after. As I said, both of these theoretical models have advantages and disadvantages. I suggest, and this is the work that I've been doing uh, for a while now, uh, also in conjunction uh, with uh, uh, my uh, uh, sometimes co-author, Paul James, at uh, uh, the University of uh, Western Australia, I suggest that we consider a third model. And the third model would be globalization as social formations. It takes a middle path, as Buddhists would say, the middle path is always good, Aristotle I think would agree. Uh, it basically expands to two dimensions to four, but cuts down from the six to four. And what it looks at is these four in terms of number one, embodied globalization, which refers to the physical mobility of human bodies across the world. So we are talking about tourists, we're talking about migrants, refugees, business travelers, retirees who can afford to travel, particularly located in the global north. So all of that sort of global spatial mobility and connectivity of human bodies would be incorporated. 
The second formation would be objectified or object-related globalization, which covers the mobility of physical objects around the world. So commodities, uh, this is of course the phase of globalization in the 1990s that everybody was talking about. New transportation technology, container technology, uh, uh, barcodes, uh, large double hulled ships uh, that were able to uh, really move commodities very quickly, the building of commodity chains that allowed uh, products to be uh, uh, produced and then linked in terms of these global value chains. Uh, so that's part of it. But when I talk about objects, we're talking about all sorts of objects, not just commodities, not just tradable commodities. We're looking at objects even you know, uh, in terms of financial objects, actual physical uh, you know, banknotes or coins. We're looking at very small objects such as greenhouse gases, CO2, such as viruses as in the current COVID-19. So it's the whole gamut of objects that uh, are moving uh, across world time and world space. The third one would be the institutional uh, uh, dimension or, or formation of globalization, which refers to global mobility uh, and connectivity of organizations, uh, empires, states, transnational corporations, international and governmental organizations, churches. Think of sports clubs like uh, Manchester United that has fan clubs, I think uh, 300 fan clubs around the world. So that's a very important formation of globalization. And then finally, disembodied globalization which I will concentrate on for, for a reason I will explain, which pertains to the relations formed through intangible things and processes, including, of course, digital exchange and communication of ideas. So a lot of people talk about disembodied globalization in terms of uh, digital globalization. But we're really talking about you know, ideas, words, images, and yes, uh, digitality or uh, the, 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 the digital component. Uh, uh, in the 21st century, of course, is very, very important. Now, importantly, what is really helpful here is that the main dimensions that usually are part of theoretical models of globalization, such as economics, politics, and culture, I'm arguing occurring within and across all of those four uh, formations. And we don't have to necessarily pick them out. What we can actually uh, assume and deal with that each one of these formations has economic, political, cultural processes, demographic processes in, in many cases going on in, inside and across. Okay, so that's the model. The advantage, as I said before, is it takes the middle path. And most importantly, I think the other advantage is that it captures uh, in, a, in a very, very remarkable way the current phase of globalization and the dynamics as they unfold. Uh, and I have also some empirical evidence that I will offer you in, in making my case. Okay, so I'm arguing then that the most consequential movement of this juncture, of disjointedness, of disconnection that is occurring as of as it is reflected in this model, is the destabilization that is occurring between disembodied globalization and the other three formations. In other words, disembodied globalization, I'm arguing, is leaping ahead, is intensifying, measured empirically in terms of what David Held and his collaborators many years ago offered us as very good criteria to measure of measurement. And that is extensity, breadth, intensity, depth, velocity, that is speed and impact. So on all of those four criteria, I'm arguing with regard to breadth, with regard to depth, with regard to speed and with regard to impact disembodied globalization has leapt ahead 
And it pertains to everything that uh, a number of commentators, perhaps most prominently uh, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum, have referred to as the fourth industrial revolution, right? So we're talking about exploding data flows, the expansion of bandwidth, 5G, uh, novel digital devices, software packages, uh, internet of things, wearables, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you name it. All of this is basically included in this leap of disembodied globalization. Now, here's my argument then, continued, right? Is the global mobility of people, things, and institutions fails to keep up with the deepening and intensification of digital connectivity, the growing stature of disembodied globalization allows it to peel off pieces of the other three tectonic plates, if you want to put it in those terms, of the other three formations. Again, it's not just that disembodied globalization is leaping ahead. It grows in stature, and by growing in stature, it starts to devour, it starts to cut into, it starts to narrow down the frameworks and the activities occurring within the other three. Two examples. One would be the application of 3D printing, which is, of course, transforming the global merchandise trade, which, as we know, has come on the serious, uh, you know, in serious, uh, gotten into serious trouble uh, during the current COVID crisis, which, of course, is built on global value chains, which is an aspect of object related globalization, objectified globalization. So, what is happening is that instead of the usual global value chains and commodity, tradable commodities being moved around. In the current phase, what we are seeing is the application of 3D printing, disembodied globalization that allows for regionalized and localized networks of exchange to have production on demand as close to the end market as possible. In other words, disembodied, digitized globalization and technology is biting into objective, objectified globalization. Another example, the service sector is being cannibalized by digital globalization's growing ability to transform embodied workers. So now we are moving over here to embodied globalization, thousands of miles away into disembodied telemigrants. I think uh, a number of us uh, are familiar with that argument and, and the uh, empirical evidence. New collaborative software packages make it possible. I'll give you a concrete example once again. Uh, a, a friend of mine uh, is a lawyer in San Francisco. He uh, typically employs annually 20 to 25 uh, 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 paralegal uh, uh, employees. They are usually taken from, you know, within his uh, uh, domestic network or local network, increasingly he's relying on paralegals from Pakistan and India who clock in, do the work uh, just as well as the other paralegals at their, of course, wage level in their countries. In other words, the arbitrage that is being yielded in this process is the wage, uh, wage differential. Another example of how disembodied globalization is taking a bite out of this apple called embodied globalization. Okay, so let me give you a visual of this. So in, for, in terms of velocity, you remember our four criteria, right? Intensity, extensity, velocity, and impact. So in terms of speed, what we're seeing here is disembodied globalization moving ahead, developing faster and quicker than the other formations of globalization, which creates a tension, which, which creates what I call a disjuncture, a disjointedness. Another visual 
which is what I talked about before, in terms of extensity, right, breadth, this embodied globalization is encroaching on other formations of globalization. Increasingly, connectivity, mobility, and imaginary are experienced even on a subjective level, and this is going to be my next talk in two months, what's happening you know, to, to ordinary individuals on their micro level, increasingly globalization is experienced in terms of electronic connectivity. Not so much in terms of embodied globalization anymore, not so much in terms of institutional globalization, objectified globalization. I am not arguing that these other forms are disappearing, obviously. We still have bodies. But my argument is that these bodies increasingly are stationary, uh, more or less uh, in front of screens, or if technology allows, they may not be quite as stationary, but they still will be enhanced in terms of all kinds of digital devices that allow for new forms of connectivity to occur. So globalization in that sense then is something that increasingly is turning the human experience into one that is uh, experienced as a digital experience or mediated by uh, digital devices and software. Okay. Another empirical evidence here. This is taken from the uh, DHL Global Connectedness Index in 2016. Uh, it's been updated uh, and it shows actually even uh, a bigger gap here if you look at the depth, again, one of the criteria that I mentioned before of global connectedness uh, between 2005 and 2015, which uh, you know we are now tracking here, international or global trade, capital information, and people flows, it shows that people, capital, and trade have not gone into reverse, but have stagnated pretty much. However, Information, especially, of course, mediated digitally, has enormously increased by a factor of 45, ultimately, is what they're arguing. So what we're seeing here is precisely this great leap ahead that I was talking about, meaning that we're looking at a, uh, a phase of globalization in which digital globalization becomes breed dominant at the expense of the others. And this was not always so. This is very important. We have to have a historical perspective on this. It used to be that, as you can see, going back in 2005, pretty close together, and you go even further back in the 1990s, the whole story of globalization was about what? Trade and capital. So what we can deduce from that is that globalization is a system or the globality system is a system that is reconfigured on an ongoing basis, which means that as globalization scholars, we must, and we have a responsibility of tracking that and understanding what those reconfigurations are and what they look like. And you can see now why I'm saying, and this is answering the second question of today's talk, I don't call this deglobalization. This is not an image of deglobalization. Of course, people who still have the 1990s and 2000s images of globalization in their head read this perhaps as deglobalization or stagnation. But what they're missing is a theoretical framework, which I've introduced today, that allows to actually capture in a theoretical uh, setting what is occurring empirically and what this current phase of globalization looks like. So, slowly getting to the end of my talk here. So what is to be done? If my analysis is correct, and I'm really very, very curious to hear uh, what uh, you have to say and, and your comments and suggestions uh, and questions, but if, if my analysis is correct, if this theoretical approach that I introduced is something that really captures in many ways what's going on, then uh, what needs to be done could be uh, uh, summarized in one phrase. We need a globalization reset. 
if globalization has become disjunctive or disjointed, it has to be balanced and realigned. So what I'm doing here is I'm introducing two new terms with re in front of them, rebalance and realign, and I'm adding them to, going back to the beginning of my talk, the work that Roland Benedictor has been doing, uh, in this case, uh, with uh, Ingrid Kofla. Uh, a couple of years ago, in 2019, they published uh, in a Global E uh, journal, uh, an a, a, a e journal that, that is, I think, widely read, uh, what they called the five R's in order to sort of think about this wild phase of globalization and in what way we need to reapproach or understand that phase of globalization. There are five re words or R words we're refining. And what they meant by that is to clarify how globalization should be periodized. And the focus, they said, should be on more recent phases of globalization, which is precisely what where I agree with. And, and, and that's part of the model, the theoretical approach that I introduced to you today. The second R was reframing. So uh, Benedicta and Kofler argued that reframing means to conceive of globalization in a different way. For example, by adapting it to new power constellation and changing contexts. The changing context, of course, is the, re, uh, the, the great uh, unsettling what's been going on, but it's also intense, intensified. And of course, uh, COVID-19 is sort of the great accelerator in the great unsettling. The third R they were talking about is reforming, which meant for them making efforts towards substantial change in mechanisms and efficiency in order to renew basic features of globalization. The fourth one was redefining, which they understood to mean to reconsider the definitions of globalization. And I think also what's implied here, not just definitions, but theoretical models of globalization, which I'm uh, uh, doing today. And this of course involves more transdisciplinary exchanges and includes, I think, new typologies and classification schemes. And then their final, the fifth R was revisioning, which meant to fundamentally reconsider globalization as such. In other words, is it desirable? Has it reached a phase that has become destructive? If so, what sort of uh, consequences do we draw from that on a policy level, on, an, on a normative level, on a philosophical level, on an economic level, on an ecological level? So I'm adding three more, rebalancing and realigning. What we need to do, given my theoretical approach here, is we need to rebalance. We need to somehow either slow down digital globalization and reconnect it to the other three in a more sustainable way, or speed up the other three. And we can talk about what that would mean. Obviously, one of the things that it would mean is to make migration, uh, uh, to accelerate migration and make it easier for people to migrate. Of course, under current conditions, uh, we, we, we are facing a real problem here. We need to also, this is the seventh R, if you want to put it that way, realign those disjointed globalization formations. And realigning means to sort of bring this whole big ship of globalization that is in danger of sort of breaking apart under the strain of its, uh, of its uh, components that are moving at different speeds and different levels of intensity and, and, and try to sort of, uh, again, through uh, a number of uh, uh, measures that we can talk about, bring them into greater alignment. Now, I think there are three concrete ways of doing that. And again, this is something that also uh, connects the work that Roland Benedict has been doing and my own work. I think we agree that there are three things that are really important. We need policy initiatives to bring those seven R's into reality 
We need education, especially as educators. And we need citizen empowerment. In other words, we need to make sure to increase the capacity of global citizens. This is one of the things that Roland has emphasized throughout that I totally agree with. Now, capacities, of course, understood in those terms, right? Education, policy, and citizen empowerment. So what I'm saying is that the final objective, what was looks perhaps now, is a very theoretical exercise that I went through today. Introducing a new typology, a new model, and working with some of the old ones to understand the current phase. Ultimately, it has an normative objective. It has an ethical objective. And this ethical objective is really global citizenship. How can we become better global citizens that are embedded within our local and regional contexts? How can we bring the local, the local and the regional and the global into conversation with each other in ways where it's not a zero sum game? In other words, to be global citizen doesn't mean that we remain on that global uh, level. I am not arguing for the replacement of a methodological nationalism or methodological localism with a methodological globalism. I'm arguing that what we need is some sort of methodological localism. And that requires us ultimately to reach goals that ultimately are normative and, and ethical and cosmopolitan to do that in conjunction with theory development, which of course, as we know in the social sciences and humanities is one of the major purposes of our enterprise. The development of new concepts, the development of new theoretical frameworks that allow us to face, understand and deal with concrete social issues with an ethical intent, with a cosmopolitan intent, with an intent to move the world into, and as, as trite as this may sound, into a little bit of a better place than it is today. So I think on that uh, sort of hopeful note, uh, I would like to uh, end my presentation today and uh, uh, entertain your uh, wanted to leave enough time to entertain your, your comments and your uh, questions. So thank you very much to Professor Manfred Steger. Uh, Manfred, uh, it was uh, incredibly interesting. Uh, and in German, we would say this is, this is a kind of Steilvorlage. So this is a great basis for, for a wonderful discussion we will have now. And I'd like to invite also in the name of uh, Roland Benedicta, uh, all of you uh, to intensively discuss uh, with uh, Manfred Steger about uh, his hypothesis, about his uh, ideas of uh, re-globalization instead of deglobalization. Um, thank you very much also for citing uh, Roland Benedicta's and Ingrid Kofler's uh, work so uh, I guess uh, a lot of work is done also at the Center for Advanced Studies uh, and based on the strong cooperation, uh, Manfred, with you, uh, we are uh, now, uh, let me say, part of this global uh, discussions, uh, uh, part of this global context uh, where we should bring forward the world with specific conditions, uh, with spe specific considerations uh, to uh, Reglobalization issues. Thank you very much also for your uh, support. Uh, I am sure that uh, Roland Benedicta will have a couple of wonderful questions, but uh, first, let's agree uh, with Roland. I invite uh, Linda Gerardello, uh, our young collaborator at the Center for Advanced Studies, uh, to uh, start with a short responding talk. Uh, based on your presentation. And after that, uh, we start with the discussion. Uh, yeah, thank you, Harald. And thank you, Manfred, for this very inter interesting introduction to your theoretical models and globalization research. I will briefly sum up 
in a few words um, what you told us and what you were speaking during your presentation. So you've talked about disjunctive globalization, um, which is embedded in this great unsettling peer, period which we are living now and which has intensified over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and um, how are we going to make sense of this? How are we dealing with this? And how does this affect, of course, uh, all the several processes that are happening around the globe and that are, um, that are part of globalization? So you've introduced us to three different models. The first one was uh, the subjective versus objective model, so based on two elements. On the one hand, goods and people traveling around the world. On the other hand, ideas, opinions, and um, ideologies. And the second model was then a more multidimensional model, which included several topics and was less binary, so to speak, including in many processes such as political, economic, environmental, and men, arts, technology, many processes that are part of today's globalized world. And third, your, um, your proposed um, theoretical model for globalization research, which is globalization understood as social formations, which include then disembodied, embodied institutional and objective one. Um, mobility and connectivity, um, and which can be measured, which is, I think, one of the interesting parts also of your research. Empirically um, measuring these processes uh, thanks to extensity, breadth, velocity, and impact that these processes have um, today on our societies. And uh, finally, you, you talked about and you showed us how globalization is actually not decreasing, but it's intensifying and speeding up, so to speak. Um, and especially with the Corona crisis, we have seen that it has been slowed down. Several flows of people, for instance, have been, uh, have been slowed down, especially last year in the beginning, but then it has it has um, it has um, become as rapid as before. It has uh, also um, intensified in for what concerns information flows. As we know that digital the digital sphere has increased a lot, especially last year. And we know that since we're here digitally today as well. So we have we have been aware of this uh, this phenomenon in our daily lives as well. Um, and finally, you, you talked about how to re uh, rebalance and realign uh, these jointed formations of globalization through education policies and, citizens em and citizen empowerment, which, um, of course, seeks to, to include various actors and players to be part and to be active parts um, and uh, conscious and aware parts of, um, of societies that are aware of the processes that are happening and that critically also try to make sense out of them. And um, yes, one of my first questions that, that I would like to ask you, Manfred, um, since you've been studying global processes uh, for a lot of years now, um, you've always tried to keep up with the phenomena that are happening around the world and um, now, currently, we have one, a big new phenomena, which is not very new, but the extent, I would say, is new uh, to which it is affecting the whole world and all societies and individuals. Um, so what do you think will be the driving forces and dominant topics in the years to come in the field of globalization studies? And do you think that the corona crisis and viruses, the idea of um, viruses tra traveling around the world will have, will cause a new understanding of globalization processes as well. And um, my second question would refer more to the second part um, of your presentation, 
since you were talking about how to realign and rebalance various um, formations of digital uh, of globalization, um, my questions would be: How can we also try to realign the theory and the practice? How can the theory, um, how can the theory meet with globalization players, um, economic, environmental, political, legal? Um, all the players, which are many, and of course, citizens can be players as well, but I would say the key players, how can the theory not be very distinct from uh, the practical players in globalized processes? Um, how can this be integrated? And how can also not only on a practical level, but also on a conscious level, how can the theory benefit those players and make them aware and more reflective of processes that they are shaping actively. Um, um, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Linda, for your, for your very apt summary, uh, you know, very well done, and also for your really two excellent questions. These are really important questions, and I'm glad that uh, you raised the first question in terms of what are some of the driving forces in the future? because, uh, uh, and I'm not trying to weasel out of that answer, but I will address that uh, in the second half of this year. So my talk number three and talk number four will focus specifically exactly on that question. And what I'm trying to do is I will, I will pick, uh, you know, within my context of these four formations, some dimensions out that I think are really, really important and, and, and engage in that, but just, just to give you a general answer to this first question. If my analysis is correct, then I think that disembodied globalization gaining in stature means that questions of technology, questions of environment are going to be really, really important. In other words, some of the driving forces will be connected to uh, the very formation of globalization that is becoming more and more predominant. Now, if we had more of an alignment, we probably would see other forces become perhaps just as prominent. The big, big mistake that we can very often make is to sort of hang on to what is currently, what is presently the big topic. It's called presentism. And one of the reasons why I showed you the slide of the great unsettling is to show you a, a, a period of 30, as you said, 30 to 40 years of all kinds of events that, you know, in many ways were really seen as driving forces at the time, right? And those 30 to 40 years, as you saw, had a number of events and guess what? Uh, when 1999, the WTO pro protests happened, everybody thought that that was the big deal. That was the thing that everybody was all of a sudden talking about. Alter globalization was talking about the alignment of ecological and labor uh, forces. Uh, everybody was talking about people on the street. Everybody was talking about this unfortunate young man who was killed in Genoa, uh, you know, in the early 2000s in the protests and so on and so forth. That was the big topic. And you know what? A few years later with 9-11, everybody was talking about transnational terrorism. And everybody said, oh yes, this is gonna be the driving force. Everything is now going to be around uh, uh, terrorism and the containment of terrorism. And we have to think about surveillance and so on and so forth. And then we had the global financial crisis and everybody was talking about the esoteric instruments that were used on Wall Street and, and the American uh, real estate bubble that spilled over and became a global uh, you know, phenomenon, a global disaster and so on. And everybody all of a sudden thought that those were the forces that we really had to watch. The economic system was going off the rail. And, and then of course the migration crisis came along and people were, all they were talking about in, in Europe was Syria, Syria, Syria. And what is going to happen and uh, you know, what's gonna happen culturally, Islam and so on and so forth, which played into the 9-11 uh, and, and 2001 discourse. So now we're all talking about pandemic and we're all talking about viruses. And I am not saying, I am not saying that this is not important. Of course, that's human nature. We need to focus on what's, what's very close at hand. 
But the problem is that we need to, in order to answer your question, what are the driving forces in ways that is informed, we can't just simply take the last thing and then extrapolate and say, you know, that's what the, what, what's going to happen. That's what we really have to focus on. We have to look at a much larger period and we have to see how these things are developing. And that's exactly what I was trying to do in terms of this new model, this new theoretical model, that I think that there's going to be a variety of forces, demographic, technological, economic, political, ideological, that are gonna be really important. And as I said, I'll be, I'll be uh, talking about this in, in my talk number three and talk number four. Your second question, also a very important question, a question that goes back in the history of the social sciences, of course, I know all the way back to, you could say, uh, Marx and in non-Western contexts, you know, all the way down to, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of cultural contexts. And that's the connection between theory and practice. You know, what the question was, what can we do in order for uh, sort of uh, theory to not just stay in this isolated bubble, but actually stay connected to practice? How can it influence lawmakers? How can it influence the general public, communities, real communities, communities like in Südtirol, communities that are, you know, have a very strong sense of identity, have a very strong sense of history, have a very strong sense of, 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 of uh, culture. So my answer to that is that we as intellectuals who are interested in theory, and that's what I've tried to do in my career, we need to speak a language that is understandable, that is accessible, that is publicly engaged. I call it engaged theory. We need to develop engaged theory talk, engaged theory of globalization that speaks to these constituencies that I've mentioned, policy, students, ordinary citizens. And even in our um, you know, academic events, we must learn to lose some of the jargon. We must be able to bring across complex, difficult theoretical concepts in ways that are generally understandable. My criterion is always, if a smart, advanced undergraduate cannot understand what I'm saying, I, I'm, I'm in trouble, I have a problem. So in many ways, our task is to be public intellectuals. Our task is as theorists, as theorists and thinkers, uh, our task is to be problem-centered, to bring down the level of abstraction without necessarily losing too much sophistication because we need to think theoretically and that means abstraction. We cannot avoid the violence of abstraction. But what we can do is we can make really good efforts to connect to the audiences that we need to reach. And language and mode of presentation are first and foremost. So I hope that that's, that's helpful. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you very much. And if I if I'm not mistaken, you are also very active on this side. You, you also are very engaged and you also do a lot of community work. That's right. um, so uh, thank you very much for this um, answer. Thank you, uh, Linda, for uh, this uh, responding talk. Thank you very much to Professor Manfred Steger for giving us uh, certain answers, uh, but also informing us that in, uh, in, further, in further talks, in further lectures, we will come back uh, to some of your questions. Yeah. Uh, so I invite all of you uh, to uh, make questions to Professor uh, Steger. Uh, please use the Q&A function or even the chat function. Yeah. Uh, I can't say, uh, see you, but you can see me, uh, and you all are invited to uh, participate in a discussion uh, with uh, our distinguished colleague, uh, Manfred Steger. Uh, use the opportunity, please, uh, to, uh, to uh, be part of, of these discussions about the future uh, of the planet, I would even say. Uh, Manfred, uh, if you allow me to uh, start, uh, let us come to the end of your lecture. You were talking about the global citizenship. Uh, 
Uh, I like the concept of the global uh, citizenship very much. And uh, you told us that we need to increase the capacities of global citizenship uh, in a way. Uh, and, and you in, 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 uh, in, you also uh, made this, uh, you started with the discussion about the embeddedness in local and regional contexts. Uh, so what about the future of global citizenship? Uh, with special consideration of the fact that we need much more connectivity between local, uh, regional on one hand and global uh, context on, on another hand. That's what you were also showing us uh, when we go to design or redesign uh, the re-globalization uh, processes. So uh, could we eventually even talk about the global citizenship instead of a global uh, citizenship in, in the near future? What is, uh, what is your perspective about that? Uh, ex excellent question. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, yes, I, I think we should talk about global citizenship. Uh, the reason why I think global citizenship is still very much ensconced is because that's the language, as you know, the concept that's been kicking around and, and has become very prominent in various education curricula, but also in, in other settings. Uh, I know that, that you know, you're, you're a, a, a very distinguished scholar on, on questions of tourism. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm aware that uh, certain tourist models uh, also are, you know, sort of informed tourism, reflective tourism that talks about, uh, you know, tourism as a way towards global citizenship. But you, you're absolutely right. Ultimately, it has to be uh, a, a form of, of of global citizenship. And what this means uh, concretely is, in many ways. Uh, you know, I'm speaking to the converted here, speaking to the center, uh, the, the members of the Center for uh, Advanced Studies, uh, because uh, what you've been doing all along is making the argument that uh, what, what we need is new educational frameworks and academic frameworks that are number one, transdisciplinary in nature. So one of the reasons why I've been pushing for so many years global studies the new field, the transdisciplinary field of global studies. That is one of the pillars is transdisciplinarity. Critical thinking is another one of the pillars. Uh, you know, space uh, is another one of those pillars. And the concept of globalization itself, of course, is also a pillar. But the reason why I think I've been pushing this is because of transdisciplinarity. And what transdisciplinarity also suggests is a new approach to learning, a new approach to teaching that critically questions our location with regard to the rest of the world. So that means that a global citizen is one who understands the particularity of her uh, embeddedness in a certain context and takes that seriously but at the same time also knows that this local context fits into a global picture that might be characterized very much by asymmetrical power relations like the global north and the global south. What does this mean? That we need to develop forms of globalization, disembodied as well as embodied, as well as institutional and objectified, that help us to realign, to connect in a more fair, in a more just way, those asymmetrical power relations. So global citizenship or global citizenship is a keen understanding of the particularity of my local standpoint with regard to, to the global picture that is deeply embedded in power relations. And I think that is applicable to many, many areas. So again, going back to tourism, what I really like for example, and, 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 and you know, you've written about this and, and, and it's, it's really important, you know, the idea of ecotourism, for example, sustainable tourism. Tourism of, that's very different. That's not just the Airbnb sort of, I don't care who's in my neighborhood tourism, but the tourism that actually uh, brings people that are uh, receptive to understanding the world in terms of these particular local circumstances that exist around the world. And that needs preparation. It also needs marketing. We don't just have to throw out everything that smells of business just because 
uh, you know, uh, uh, a number of, of, of corporations and, and the system itself, capitalism, you know, is, is flawed. We have to develop new ways of being entrepreneurial, of, being, of developing businesses that take into consideration very seriously this idea of local citizen. So it means going back again to Roland's complexity theory, it means that we have to understand globalization as bigger, as larger than the sum of its parts. And that's also true for global citizenship. It has its parts, but it's bigger than any of those parts, but still we have to bring them together. So I hope, you know, again, that this is something that, uh, you know, we can, we can agree on that, that in, in many ways, the, the, the question of globalization is a question of localization. Thank you, uh, Manfred. I liked uh, your answer very much. Uh, I agree fully with you that um, in the tourism development, regional development uh, are based on, on the creation of, of uh, uh, local uh, value chains. Uh, we are talking about circular economy uh, more and more. But uh, what we need is an embeddedness of the circular economy in a global context. Uh, uh, when we talk about climate change issues, we should in, in, include this discussion in a circular economy, which is, uh, which is uh, let me say, a two-level uh, idea between local, regional on one hand and global uh, dynamics on, on the other hand. So I agree fully on the idea to say, let's, let's move toward a kind of local uh, citizenship. Uh, you were talking about the global formations uh, and were uh, discussing about education, policy, and citizen empowerment. Uh, so is that in, in, in line then with this, uh, what does it mean when you discuss about glo global citizenship? What does it mean to empower citizens? Uh, what does it mean to educate uh, people? Uh, uh, is, is there something very, very special what we not did in the past? Meanwhile, we have to focus much more in a near future. What can we learn from, from let me say, some things we, we probably did not in the right way in the past? Yes, uh, uh, global citizenship means in the educational realm, to answer very concretely, we need new curricula. Mm -hmm. We need new ways of teaching. The old disciplines are just not going to wash it anymore. Absolutely. We need to organize, for example, very concretely, uh, we need to organize, and I've made this proposal uh, several times, we are working on one here at the University of Hawaii, we need to increasingly organize teaching and learning, education, not around specific disciplines necessarily, even though it's fine to have, uh, you know, a specialty in one discipline, but especially graduate education, have to increasingly we should orient it around concrete research questions. So let's say that uh, you know we want to we want to work on the question of sustainable tourism. So we get people who are in business school. We get people who are sociologists. We get people who are economists. We get people who are historians. We get people who are interested in tourism issues to come together in projects, maybe for three years, for four years, for five years, for six years, and then you may want to move on to another, maybe related, maybe not real related. Uh, research project or re research cluster. And you learn a lot in the process. You talk mm -hmm. to other people who have different backgrounds. So rather than staying for the rest of our lives in silos that are defended uh, very, very vigorously, I'm a sociologist, I'm a political scientist, I don't go to the Political Science Association, I go to the Sociology Convention, right? Uh, instead of being defensively anchored in these silos and building our career and reputation, on that basis. I think what we need is these new curricular uh, initiatives and frameworks that are organized around projects. So in the educational realm, this is what I'm pursuing very much and have been pursuing. So when I was in Australia, we completely remodeled the entire uh, school that I, that I was leading from a school that was very much sort of a bubble school into something that was much more transdisciplinary, organized uh, around particular kinds of research projects. So that would be a concrete answer with regard to education. Great, thank you very much, uh, Manfred. Uh, Roland, if you allow me, I would move to a question from Daria and give uh, the word, the floor then to you. Daria uh, Habicher is asking, uh, Manfred, to what extent could reglobalization also mean deconstruction or better rückbau? Rick, 
We know that global structures, dynamics and dependencies are difficult to dismantle, which is of course not even necessary in certain areas. But if we think on, of agriculture and food procurement, for example, or the procurement of medical products, uh, so uh, to what extent could reglobalization also mean deconstruction uh, or a uh, Brilliant question. Beautifully formulated. Thank you, Daria. Uh, really well done. Really important question. Uh, let me try to answer it uh, straightforwardly by saying there has to be some sort of agency in that Rückbau that starts with you, Daria. In other words, if you agree that globalization has entered a disjunctive phase, a disjointed phase. If you agree that there's a, what Roland called a wild phase, what I call uh, a disjunctive phase in the context of the great unsettling, what is it that you think should be rückgebaut? Was bauen wir zurück? Right? And I think that there are a number of answers. And I'm starting with the individual level because you, you, you raised the question so, so beautifully. And we can you know, move to the structural level if you like. But I would argue that perhaps you could argue that I can or won't spend uh, X number of hours on uh, you know, my iPhone or on uh, you know, screens of all kinds of sorts. I'm going to prioritize more face-to-face -face interaction. I'm going to prioritize in the context, of course, of what's possible. But you know, we are in a very privileged situation here in the global north. We really do have time. Uh, you know, not as much time as we want to, but certainly more time than people uh, in the global south who are in very different situations. So we can actually rückbauing our own uh, preferences with regard to digital globalization and re-enter other formations of globalization. And that means in an embodied way, it also means in an institutional way. Maybe you want to become more active, give more of your time uh, at you know, some sort of uh, local organization that you feel affinity for or connected to, that of course is also linked in a, in a network-like way to other organizations. So I think this is a, it becomes a very intensely personal question. Food, right? Agriculture, what sorts of foods do you buy? What does a Rückbau mean with regard to your consumption habits? Where can you, where can you sort of, uh, you know, where do you shop? Is it all gonna be digitally online, Amazon? Or are you still patronizing your local grocery that's on the verge of going out of business? Can we shift the balance here a little bit? And I think the more people are really doing that kind of thing, and of course it has to be coordinated. It, it, in, in our world, it's always a question of synchronization. It's always a question of political activism. It's always a question of communicating those kinds of goals. It's always a question of parties, political parties or, or organizations that make those goals a priority. But this Rückbau in a more sustainable way, if people jump on that bandwagon, will change the overall dynamic of globalization. It will slow digital globalization. It will strengthen other forms of globalization. So I think for me at least, the invitation here is self-reflection connected with social and political engagement in a communal setting, in a concrete communal setting that then allows you to actually do both at the same time to, uh, to have some sort of Rückbau activity with regard to your institutional, your structural involvement, as well as your own uh, individual uh, outlook. Mm -hmm. Miriam uh, Gruber uh, from the center, uh, Manfred is also uh, starting a discussion. At the moment, it seems that globalization has a quite negative impact on climate change or the environment. How can globalization processes or reglobalization support climate change adaptation or mitigation or environmental protection? 
or on the other way around, climate change is a challenge for globalization processes and economic liberalism, right? What do we need to change in order to create a sustainable re-globalization? Who mm -hmm. be the major actors? Those, of course, is, is I would say, a mega, mega, mega question, right? <laughs> we all know the mega shark movies, right? So, so I think Miriam has unleashed a mega shark on me. Uh, uh, and that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't, not, number one, I don't think that there is one answer that sort of is the overall question, you know, like in the matrix, uh, the red pill, uh, you know, that, that gets us into, into uh, understanding that we are caught in the matrix. And now from now on, we're going to be unplugged and we're going to do things in a very, very different way, right? So I don't say, I, I would say that there is no one single question that can uh, respond to that. I think that there are many, many small answers to this. So particularly with regard to globalization processes, right, uh, that impact climate change or, or uh, deal with climate change uh, mitigation. I think the biggest uh, understanding here is that what we are dealing with is a energy system or an, an, an uh, uh, way of procuring energy that has clearly outlived its purpose. I think we can all agree on that. Fossil fuel, uh, a fossil uh, fuel based, uh, you know, uh, uh, energy is, is, is certainly not sustainable. So the question then becomes, what do we do in order to switch to A, more sustainable forms, and B, do that very quickly, because if we don't do it quickly, it might be too late. Some people argue, as, as we all know, that we already might be past the point of return in terms of the 1.5 degrees that everybody sees as some sort of uh, threshold here. So the, 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 the response that I, I would give to that is energy get into, uh, again, organize with like-minded people, put pressure on uh, your uh, local government, uh, uh, you know, tie into uh, what is called the uh, global civil society as much as you can. Uh, of course, uh, you know, some of that means digital globalization, right? In other words, you will have to use some of the, the connectivities that I was talking about that have taken over uh, at this point. On the other hand though, and this is where the local comes in, it also means intense embodied forms of engagement. It means uh, going out and demonstrating. It means going to hearings, to boring hearings of neighborhood boards that deal with energy questions right here in, in your backyard. So it, in a sense, uh, it goes back to what Harold was saying. I think local citizenship and the sort of awareness that comes along with that could be the motivator in getting people to become engaged in this way. So in, in my, my response is what needs to change in order to uh, create sustainable recreation, what needs to change is the level of social engagement. We need to all become part of it soon, quickly, as much as we can. Because without the pressure, we know that from history, going back to slavery, uh, the women's movement, uh, the civil rights movement, migration movements, you name it. Without social and political pressure, we're not going to make it. We're not going to address these climate change issues. Thank you, uh, Manfred. And thank you, uh, Miriam, for the great question. We have three questions more. Uh, Valeria from Miller, our head of communication at Center for Advanced Studies, you were talking also about science communication. It is often a challenge for science communication to formulate texts in such a way that they can actually be understood by the general public. After all, you don't want to give the audience too little credit, but on the other hand, the text should be appealing and easy to read and also do justice to the researcher. Sometimes one gets the impression that it is more about reputation among peers than about really informing the public uh, about science. What a great message. Should you know 
universities also focus more on helping scientists learn to make their research more accessible. In addition, the pressure of competition is also high in science, so that there is hardly any time left for adequate preparation of research for the general public. How could that be changed? Uh, because this current system also contributes to the fact that it is only becomes more difficult to bring the really important issues to the people that really concern them. With globalization, globalization it is ultimately all of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wonderful, wonderful question yeah. again, Valeria. And uh, I totally agree. Uh, you picked up on the accessibility point uh, to make it more accessible. But you know, that's hard. And it's especially hard for early career researchers. I'm talking now specifically because you raised the issue of scientists, social scientists, natural scientists. It's very hard to do that. Why? Because it's about finding your footing in a profession that, as we all know, puts a lot of pressure on you in terms of producing, in terms of deliverables. The language is a neoliberal language of production, publications, teaching. So, you want to progress. You want to get uh, pragmatized, right? You want to get tenured. You want to be able to find your footing. So I would say it's very hard for early career uh, scientists and researchers to do that, to, in other words, give up this sort of reputation and choose a language that is more accessible and make the world a better place. But here's the good news. Maybe not so good news because we're all getting older and hopefully wiser and more established and more secure. That's a big question in the future, who knows? But at least for the moment. So there comes the time where you can be more daring, where you can sacrifice maybe some of your academic ambitions to make your work more accessible. Even if your colleagues say, oh, well, you know, she's just a popular, a, 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 you know, a, a sort of popularizing these things. She's a popularizer. When I wrote 20 years ago, when I wrote this little book for globalization called A Very Short Introduction, Globalization, A Very Short Introduction, my colleagues at the time said, Manfred, don't do that. This is almost like a textbook, you're writing this for general readers, you're writing this for students, you're writing this on a, on a level that's not really fully an academic level. Don't do it. It's not good for your reputation. And my answer was, you know what? That's fine. I, I'm relatively secure. I need to speak out. I need to connect. I need to be accessible. I need to get this thing across. So my answer is, let's try to when the professional circumstances allow it to be a little bit more daring, to be a little bit more accessible, to write for journals that you might not write for because they're not as reputable, but they reach more people, to write in a language where you, maybe some of your colleagues frown, but you're actually doing sort of the, the, the practical work that needs to be done in order to change things. And that's your last question, all of these questions about change. They're social, they, these are all social change questions. How do we affect social change, right? We affect social change in two ways. Number one, we become less egotistical and more other oriented. Number two, we become <clears throat> less self-engaged and more socially engaged. If we can do that, the world has a chance to, to change in a, in, a, in a good direction. Thank you. Uh, two questions or even three. Uh, uh, Günther uh, Kolonia uh, from Eurak is uh, asking, dear Manfred, I was intrigued by one of the last slides in which you see that the immaterial digital globalization has increased a lot. Whereas the movement of goods and people has stagnated or even decreased. You say there should be a realignment between them. Personally, I see this diverge even more in the future. Just look at us today. We are all not sitting in the Eura conference hall, but we are all in different places in front of the PC. I don't even know whether you are in New York, in Honolulu or in Perth. Uh, and it doesn't even matter. 
Uh, but thinking of the carbon footprint of bringing just you to Bolson and the climate goals of uh, having emissions in this decade, I think people and goods will move less, not only because of the pandemic, but because of the imperative to reduce emission. Yeah, thank you, Günther. Thank you for your very kind remarks and also for your really, really good insight here. You know, of course, like everything, it's not a zero sum game. It's not an all or nothing question. When, when, I, when I criticize the, the leap, I am not saying that digital globalization doesn't have its advantages. Of course it does. As a matter of fact, during the pandemic, you know, it's because of Zoom that we were able to stay connected to our loved ones, right? So in that sense, the, 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 the very problem of disconnection was bridged by something that ironically in the long run, if we rely on it too much, will disconnect us more and more. So there's this dialectic in there. And clearly digital globalization, disembodied globalization, uh, you know, has its good sides. So I'm not arguing against that. But what I'm saying is that if you're right and it's moving in this direction, we might maybe reduce the carbon footprint. I don't know if it's gonna be enough to really make a major difference, but we might reduce our carbon footprint, but we are also going to be in trouble socially. I can tell you that. And I'll talk about this in two months when I talk about the so-called, what I call the, un, or Hegel called the unhappy consciousness. I think we're developing an unhappy consciousness. A consciousness that is divided against itself. A consciousness that is on one hand, experiencing more and more digital connectivity as a source of identity on one hand, and on the other hand, that is still very much anchored in the physical world and very often experiences the loss of physical world as real loss, as something that is sad and something that is, 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 has to be overcome. So what I think is that if you're right, and this pessimistic scenario plays itself out, that uh, digital globalization is eating up uh, most of the other forms of globalization, we as a human species will change. We'll become a different homo, homo digitalis. You know, we will have not just variables, we'll have imprints. Maybe parts of our brains eventually will be able to be downloaded into software programs and, and, and we don't have to worry anymore about uh, things like physical bodies because uh, there's gonna be very few things left. Who knows? My bigger point is, and this is what I'm trying to do, uh, trying to say here, is that realignment is so important because I think we need all of those dimensions of globalization. We can't have one sort of crowd out all the others. We have bodies, we like digital connectivity, we need institutions, and you know, we certainly need objects and deal with objects and have objectified experiences. I hope that that helps. That's definitely. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manfred. Uh, two questions, one from Christian Pfeiffer, I guess from outside Eurac. Thank you for this outstanding presentation. As I am involved in the policy sphere of the discussions around disembodied globalization, tackling especially intangibles, I would like to ask how to really delineate the other formations. Within the G20 digital, digital economy task force, we are reflecting on this. Uh, we are reflecting, sorry, I lost it. We are reflecting on this and it seems very difficult to find suitable indicators to agree upon as a group. What we do with the help of the OECD is to focus on overcoming gaps of divides. If one looks at the current definition uh, developed last year, it seems that digital is covering nearly everything. With the COVID-19 crisis, this has even intensified as also the local level often gets more digitalized. So as you rightly pointed out, there has been an acceleration. So my question is, where would you draw the line that divides the formations? You might explain this uh, further also in the upcoming lectures, but it would be really relevant input for policymakers in trying to convene on governance models, uh, for example, on AI? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, what, what we do when we present theoretical models, as I said before, Kristen, and thank you for your really, really good question. 
because uh, the question of boundaries, as is, is, is systems theorists know, is, is really a big one, right? The whole idea of closed systems versus open systems, and if this does this binary really work, right? Uh, what, what we always do is when we introduce models is we do violence to, uh, you know, the everyday world, the complexity of the everyday world. But we can't get out of it. We need to abstract. We need to draw distinctions. We need to offer definitions. We need to say A is not B in order to understand how B, A and B relate to each other. It's funny because it's not the Aristotelian logic, it's the Buddhist logic. It's the logic of uh, A is not A, therefore A is A. Meaning that we have to be able to draw analytic distinctions in order to understand that in the real world, those things bleed into each other. But we still need to make analytic delineations. So where do you draw the boundaries? You always draw the boundaries in terms of your definitions in terms of your core concepts. This is why I called it embodied globalization. Now, you know, it used to be quite easy to say, well, you know, this is where the body begins and this is where the body ends. You know, if you hit me on my thigh, that was my body because that hurts. You know, if you stop two inches short, you know, that's not it. So in a way, the definitions are reflecting those boundaries. The problem is that as digital globalization or as disembodied globalization is eating more and more into these formations, it becomes more and more difficult to draw these boundaries because digital globalization is starting to bleed more and more into, even conceptually, the others. So wearables, extensions, prostheses, is that embodied or is that not embodied? Is that digital? Increasingly, as we all know, prostheses are digital. They're rechargeable, they're doing all kinds of fancy things. So, you know, where do we draw the boundaries? What becomes embodied, what becomes digital? But that's my point, Kristen. That's precisely the problem. The problem is that what used to be more clearly distinguishable in terms of boundaries is increasingly monopolized by, quote, the digital that eats into the other formations. So I'd be very happy to stick with very conservative definitions. Bodies, as we understand physical bodies, objects as they are separable and movable and transformable and describable, uh, institutions as we can identify them and empirically verify certain processes, and of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, disembodied globalization in terms of digitality, in terms of digital connections. Thank you, Manfred. A last question by uh, Martin Wensing uh, before I give the floor to uh, Roland uh, Benedicta. Martin is writing. Uh, Hi, thank you for a brilliant talk. What is the role of tradition in your framework? I'm just a dilettante, but some, some might say that the backlash against globalization came because people could not relate anymore to how they were supposed to live, presumably in addition to the story of losers and winners of globalization. You can tell them that we are all going to be living in this and this way, and that, that is better. But who determines what is better? What if they just don't want what you and I think is better? This may sound a bit conservative, but some people are conservative. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Martin. Uh, obviously, who determines what is better is very often a generational question. And even within a generation, generational cohort, obviously, you have very different positions in terms of what better is. But it relies on what I called uh, democratic empowerment. If you have if you have people who are democratically empowerment, it's the people who ultimately make decisions that will determine what we think is better. So finally, in this country, after uh, four wildly years, let's put it this way, uh, people have hopefully come to their senses and think that the current administration represents a better way, a way forward. That came about as a result of democratic 
decision making, formation of will, and things like that. So ultimately, who determines what is better is the people. The question is, you know, number one, who are the people? And, uh, you know, where, where do you draw the boundaries between, say, uh, national people uh, versus, you know, a, a global population that has to face global problems? That's a different story. So ultimately, we need decision making on, I think, on a global uh, scale, at least in order to answer these types of questions. People are conservative. Yes, of course, they're conservatives. That's, that we're all conservative in, in many ways, like all systems. Systems like stability, but systems always get disturbed internally, externally, and then endogenous change, ex exogenous change. So we always have to deal with change, whether we like it or not. Most people don't want to change. That's true. So I think what we have to do as part of our educational capacity of our educational engagement is to talk about change and to also, and I think this is where you, the tradition comes in, Martin. I think to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Not every digital device is the greatest thing since buttered bread. We don't have to hop on every bandwagon just because uh, you know, uh, the advertisement uh, industry is telling us we all have to go, uh, you know, digital this, digital that. We can be conservative a little bit. We can think about tradition. But I think the thinking about tradition, being conservative, should not keep us at the same time also from accepting change. So again, it's a question of the middle way. It's a question of balance. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, I'd like to move to uh, Roland. Uh, Roland, I'm sure that you have a lot of uh, wonderful questions uh, in your rucksack. So uh, go ahead. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right, Harald, with your assumption. First of all, let me thank Manfred very much for this very, really excellent basis for uh, our series. I think this is um, the perfect contribution to start with. And uh, thank you also so much, Manfred, for mentioning a joint work in Melbourne on the global systemic shift, which was, um, for me at least, a very uh, important experience um, to, to draw upon in, um, in, in the work that I did afterwards. First of all, I would like to uh, just share an observation, and then I have two very short and easy questions, apparently. The first uh, shared observation is that I think what we discussed now is extremely interestingly connected to a general development, especially in Central Europe, about the drivers, the, the core forces of current globalization. <clears throat> you have in Italy, in Germany, and in France, a kind of four-dimensional debate and, and framework that is to some extent really close to what you, Manfred, um, has sketched as a main intermediate framework, which brings together very different factors. In fact, uh, you have a debate in Central Europe uh, on four dimensions, four drivers uh, that have to be taken into consideration. The first one is called globalization, which is understood as a globalization wanted by a few neoliberal drivers like Microsoft, international corporations that are still interested in continuing the globalization we had so far. And this is called globalization. The second driver would be mondialization, or in Italian, mondializzazione, also in German, mondialisierung, which would be kind of the natural overall process produced in an in um, irreversible manner by new technologies, uh, by the change in behavior, and by the rise of a global imaginary that you so brilliantly described. The third dimension would be uh, what is called globalism, which is not the same like globalization or uh, mondialization. Globalism would be the effort of an elite to which you and I and most of our audience probably belong to reform 
to rebrand, to reset, as you said, globalization. Um, and that is globalism, a pro-positive approach uh, to voluntarily engage in a new globalization, engaged globalization. And then there is a fourth dimension, which is called cosmologization. And cosmologization would be a process that is going beyond what is meant with globalization and, of course, its fallouts like deglobalization or reglobalization. There is something that goes beyond all these kind of dialectics and logics, which would be cosmologization. So we would have basically four dimensions that to some extent, I think, uh, really, really kindly meet what you, um, what you sketched. First, globalization as the continuation of old forces, which others try to break down or to interrupt. Mondialization, the bigger process that is irreversible. Globalism as a kind of specific approach to all this, which to some extent, and here I, I am with the latest um, question, uh, excludes um, the neo-traditionalists. Is, is globalism is a widely progressive approach. And then cosmologization, which deals with the development that we see now very massively occurring, the expansion of humanity into the surrounding space, outer space, um, so humanity is in the process, and this might be the real revolution of our age to expand beyond terrestrial uh, logics and realms and to settle down on Mars. All Greek powers have uh, space missions on the way uh, to start with asteroid mining, to import resources from space, which could have an impact on the environment, the question. So cosmologization is something uh, that, that opens up kind of a completely new dimension, a new, a new territory for what we call this expansive force of globalization. Now this uh, four dimensional uh, um, framework that is discussed, for example, uh, in Germany, in uh, the German government um, and in other spheres in order also to gain a strategy, I think is kind of complementary or even identical to what you say it deals with with embodied factors, it deals with um, disembodied factors, it deals with the imaginary um, at least as much, and this is also you merit, uh, Manfred, decisive merit to have upgraded uh, the importance of the imaginary uh, as compared to the simply materialistic sphere, which was always em emphasized of, of late Marxism and even, even um, by postmodernism. So you elevated the status of the imaginary uh, to the point that now we take it seriously as we take other factors uh, as a policy element that has impact. If you consider all this, and there would be much to say and much to develop jointly, Manfred, in this sense, because I think your four-dimensional system has so much to, to add to these four dimensions that are in a kind of experiment um, debated in, in, in circles, uh, also in France, for example, by Piketty and others. Um, there would be a, a debate, and we can, of course, uh, continue it then in, in other um, environments. But let me come out of this four-dimensional um, framework to my two questions. And the first question would be, where do you locate the youth movements that we see today? And my own daughter is very heavily engaged um, in this international movement. I don't speak only of, of um, um, Thunberg or the, the, the uh, kind of climate change um, revolution or upheaval um, as it is meant by the youth. But what I observe is that the youth is not really about globalization. In many ways, these young people are anti-globalist because they don't like the globalization we had. They don't like the people who were driving them. They are to some extent even skeptical against mondialization. And they are certainly 
uh, not part of the globalism sphere because they think it is too elitist to some extent what we are doing as intellectuals that you mentioned. So most of the youth movement are kind of close to the cosmologization thing. It is moving beyond current patterns. It is extending to a completely new age, to a new start. Uh, it's all, for, for many of, of the younger uh, people, that are now down on the streets, out on the streets, protesting for the environment, for a renewal of globalization, they, they really don't want to renew or to rethink what, what comes from the past. They expect a complete new start, perhaps also connected to the space um, revolution. And that brings me to my second and last question, Manfred. What do you think um, about the cosmologization of humanity uh, it will be the impact on uh, what we do as globalization scholars. Because my um, impression is that we have, until now, almost completely um, uh, neglected to include the recent 10 years uh, where all major powers, including the United States, but especially also China, India, South Africa, European Union landing on asteroids, which was impossible uh, until recently, flying um, a drone on Mars uh, just a, a few weeks ago. What this will open up spiritually, religion-wise, economically, culturally, um, um, even politically uh, to humanity, we have completely neglected to, to, to think about um, including this in the globalization theory, because I, my belief is at the moment that globalization will not persist as globalization under the term we, we knew it, but it will integrate cosmologization and that will completely change its face. If you read the, and I conclude the, the early reports of the astronauts, that the view of the earth from, from space completely changed everything, the culture, the personal uh, self-awareness, the, 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 the view on the whole globe in every angle, um, and even the, the spirits. The, 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 there was a kind of neo-religiosity, uh, neo-connectedness that was, in, to some extent, described very closely to Buddhism, as you, as you mentioned it. Uh, so, so a kind of cosmological Buddhism as a new religion beyond religions, all this, I think, is the process we are in. And we have to include this in uh, rethinking globalization. And the question is, should we rethink globalization or is it a completely new phase we are in? Sorry for <laughs> this long, <laughs> all right, sorry very much for this long uh, discourse, but I think it is necessary also to honor the so excellent basis and framework um, Manfred gave us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Roland. I guess it was also important that you, uh, first of all, underline the importance of uh, uh, Manfred's uh, lecture, but then also uh, your reflection was absolutely needed and helpful uh, just in order to embed everything we discussed uh, this morning. Uh, so thank you very much for that. The last uh, five minutes, uh, Manfred, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I think, uh, respond to, to uh, uh, Roland's uh, qu two questions, and then just say a few, just a very short uh, sort of parting words here. But uh, number one, thank you very much, Roland, for uh, uh, conveying to me this, this sort of model. And if there's anything in, in, in print that you can share with me that would lay that out in more detail, I would greatly appreciate that because I think this is an interesting, it's an interesting discussion. Uh, and I'm not quite clear on the categories, but I'm clear enough to get a, get a sense that, that you know, what, what those are. But I'd like to see a more in-depth thing. So if you can send that to me, that'd be great. Uh, where do you, the first question was, where do, you, where do I locate the youth movement? And your, question, your response was, uh, you see them more as sort of anti-globalist, especially with regard to the neoliberal one. I think that's that's true, but I don't think they're anti-globalist. I think they're alter-globalist. I think they're still very much 
uh, believers, especially through the environmental movement that is so much anchored in young people. Also in uh, questions of uh, GLPTQ and other cultural issues. I think those are global questions, as we know. Those are not just national questions, identity questions and so on. So I think that I wouldn't describe them, I would describe them as anti-globalist with regard to the neoliberalism one, yes. But I think that they want to see another world and they can think globally and they're interested in thinking globally, uh, but they're deeply disappointed and rightfully so. What, if I may point the finger at myself, what our generation has not done and the kinds of privileges that we have enjoyed that they most likely are not going to have. And they have every reason to be upset about that. And I think part of what, what you feel, and, and I think what is coming out also here in the United States is that sense of you know, uh, resentment. Uh, and, and therefore they wanna see a different world. Now, exactly what this world is and how much they reflect upon, it's hard to tell. My students, you know, uh, they're, they're very different. There are some who are completely hooked into the technology and the others who are much more reflective and want to go back to the land and want to be much more connected to ind indigenous ontologies and, 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 and different kinds of experiences. So I think it's a mixed bag. But what really unites them generationally, I think, is that they want to see a different, another world. And I think that they are the ones who not only can do it, hopefully, but must do it. And that leads me to your second question. Roland, uh, I think the one problem with your uh, sort of understanding that we as global studies scholars should engage more uh, cosmopolitanization or cosmologization or whatever it's called is that Roland, we don't have the time. It's 51 years ago that we set foot on the moon and did it a couple of years after, but haven't done it for half a century, which makes my point about embodied globalization or embodied cosmologization, if we want to. In other words, if those things are happening that you're describing, they have to number one, happen very, very fast because we are running out of time because our planet is running out of time. Or, it's going to be an elite engineered project that involves very few people. That this form of, of expansion into the cosmos or into the solar system or into asteroids is gonna be one that's gonna be run by software and by machines, not by humans. In other words, by embodied humans sitting in there. Colonizing Mars is at least a few decades uh, into the future. If I am correct, in, in terms of sufficient numbers we're talking about, not just you know one little station or something like that. If, I, if I'm correctly informed, most ecologists agree that as far as climate change is concerned, until we see mass, mass migrations, until we see massive areas being uninhabitable, uninhabitable to human beings, is about 20 years away, maybe even less. Well, let's be generous. Let's say 30 years. In yes. 30 years, we're gonna have a situation here on this planet if we don't do something that you call globalism. And if it's a lead engineer, so be it. That really changes what's happening here. We're never gonna get to the stage that you're talking about in terms of you know, expansion into outer, outer space. So for me, that's a total sideshow that involves some rich people and a lot of, of disembodied gadgets. But in the next 30 years, it's not gonna involve tens of thousands of people moving out of this planet somewhere else. So that means for me, what we're really talking about is we as globalization scholars have to resist that kind of model that you're talking about and say, no, we're not going to spend too much time on it other than like you and I enjoy sci-fi movies. So yes, you know, that we're gonna continue doing. Uh, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, we are going to spend as much time as we can to be part of that globalism project, of that project that is trying to uh, save the planet 
It's trying to make the planet more sustainable. It's trying to make a shift in 20 to 30 years. You know, the Great Barrier Reef is dying in, at a rate where in 10 years it will not exist. 95% of the corals will be dead. That's 10 years. So, you know, we simply don't have the time. So I think what we should do is, as global studies scholars and globalization scholars is really engage, uh, as, uh, as Bruno Latour puts it, back to earth, terrestrial issues, terrestrial issues first and foremost. And if we make it, then all the power to you and all the power to cosmologicization. I'm all with it. <laughs> Thank it's you. Fun. But that will be a long, long time. I, I would have, I would have to say something on that, but I don't uh, think. Roland, uh, we, but we have to close. Huh? <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> uh, so um, allow me to uh, to come to an end, uh, even if I would also be happy uh, to 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 continue with the discussion. Uh, but since we fixed, uh, we defined uh, two hours. Uh, Manfred, you can see that there is not enough time to, uh, to go into details, but we will have uh, another opportunities. Uh, so uh, Olam Benedicta uh, agreed uh, with you on a second public lecture. And the public, second public lecture will be on 24th of June, uh, again at 9 uh, Central European time. Uh, so uh, we will be happy to uh, to have another uh, wonderful, uh, to, to listen to uh, another lecture and to uh, go into details and reflect about uh, future, the future of globalization. I have to thank uh, you, Manfred. This was a really, really outstanding uh, starting uh, moment uh, and a crucial moment, uh, as Roland and me always are saying, also for the development, the further development of Center for Advanced Studies uh, at Eurac and for the Eurac as a, as a, uh, as, uh, in, in, in the context of Eurac. Second, I have to say thank you very much uh, to uh, Roland. Uh, he invented this uh, go, a public lecture with you, uh, Manfred. Uh, I guess this was a really good idea. When we saw the questions and we uh, uh, listened to the answers. Uh, I'm sure that uh, this uh, was, a, was a great moment also yeah? from a scientific point, uh, but also from a very, very action-based uh, practical point uh, of view. And third, I have to say thank you very much to Linda. Uh, uh, thank you for the responding talk. Uh, thank you for the preparation. Uh, thank you also to uh, Ingrid Koflo, uh, who together with Manfred and uh, Roland uh, is bringing forward uh, the idea of uh, globalization studies uh, at, at Eurac Center for Advanced uh, Studies. Thank you very much and all the best